Thanks, Parker. Okay, so um, I ha like like uh, like Parker just said, Wendy and I have been coming here for almost 30 years. Wendy started coming to Good News in 1992, and then I started coming in 1994, and so we've been coming for that long. And I've da no one's ever asked me to preach before, so uh, it took 30 years uh, to get asked. And so if today goes well, then I'm really hoping that when I turn 80, I'm going to get asked to preach again. So um, let's just let's just pray that it goes well, but. Uh, it is fun. That's my family. Um, uh, Wendy and I have really enjoyed being a part of Good News for all these years, and um, you, you've seen us come here at the, Wild, the World Golf Campus since Dave and Sue Ellen started leading here. Um, you know, uh, Wendy and I met, what you probably don't know is that Wendy and I met at a small group, a Good News small group. And so when I first moved here in 1994, I went to small group, and, and there was this beautiful woman that talked to me. And so, um, so Wendy and I met, and so the, uh, really, the, it's really neat because Smiley, the uh, founding pastor of our church, uh, Smiley's parents were still alive, and uh, they used to greet at the door, and, um, and it was before we even had a campus, and it was at the Riverview Club, and, and I walked in, and then a, a few minutes later, Wendy walked in, and Smiley's mom said to Wendy, before we'd really started talking at all, you should marry that man, and so... Um, so thank you, uh, Smiley's mom. And so, uh, but it is so fun. And I hope this is fun. I was so happy that I got to preach today because I knew I would have fun. So I prayed that you would have fun um, as we talk about things. In town, you heard uh, what a little bit from Parker about what I do. Um, in addition to being an elder here, uh, Wendy and I own Endless Summer Realty. And then outside of town, um, I, outside of this community mostly, I am the CEO of this organization that helps Christian ministries raise money to build God's kingdom. I like to say our mission of the focus group, which is this great company I get to be a part of, we're, we're, we're making all things new, you know, restoring the world by helping incredible ministries have the funds they need to fulfill their missions. And so I live in these two worlds, real estate and fundraising. They seem very normal to me. Um, but... Um, <laughs> But I did, I did, I did, wanted to tell you that, just to tell you who I am. And then I wanted to say that I, uh, as a Christian, like I met Christ in high school in Young Life. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. And we're in a series about I am statements in the Bible, right? So there's all these statements where Jesus says, you know, I am this, I am that, I am that. They're metaphors, they're so fun. And um, in my life, um, I struggled with these statements. Because I just, it didn't make sense. Like, I, I just remember first reading them in John and, and not fully grasping them. But as I've spent time over the last, you know, 40 years being a Christian, I've realized that these, these statements, these I am statements are some of the most amazing statements that Jesus made. Because they're the ones that, that really show us that Jesus can help us in a way that no one else can, right? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, before I read the scripture, I wanted to pray. So let's pray. So Lord, thank you so much for what you have done and are doing through good news here in our community. Uh, Jesus, thank you for being both fully human and fully God. Thank you for, for being able to help us in a way that no one or nothing can help us in the world. And so Lord, today I pray that you would speak through me and that you would allow us all to leave with at least one thought that helps us grow closer to you. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Okay, so I told you that to, we're talking about I am statements, and today we're talking about John 10, verses 7 through 10, where Jesus says, I am the door. And so I want to read it with you here. And so, so, so Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So there you go. That's the ESV version. Now, something I do in my time with Jesus every day is I often will read a verse, like I just did, and then I'll be like, huh, that's awesome. But the Bible was originally written in Greek, and then it's been translated a lot. And so I read the ESV, and that's usually where I start. And then I like to read some other versions 
and let, let the word of God speak to me using slightly different words, right? The Greek's always the same, but, but how it's translated is sometimes allows me to hear it better. So I'm going to read to you two other versions of the same verse. The first is the Phillips, the J.B. Phillips version. I am the door. If a man goes in through me, he will be safe and sound. He can come in and out and find his food. The thief comes with the sole intention of stealing and killing and destroying. But I came to bring them life and far more life than before. Okay, that was Phillips. Now I'm going to go to the message, right? The message version. So he tried again. I'll be explicit then. This is Jesus talking, remember? I am the gate for the sheep. All those others are up to no good. Sheep stealers, every one of them. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Anyone who goes through me will be cared for, will freely go in and out and find pasture. A thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they, might, they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Okay, so there it is, same verse in three different translations, right? And so what does it say, right? So what it basically says is that it says, Jesus says he's two things, and then he makes two promises, right? And they're incredible things that Jesus says he is. First, he says that Jesus says, I am the door, right? He is the door. And then he's, he's also saying he's the shepherd because he's talking about sheep. Like he's guiding the sheep. So Jesus says, I am the door. We're going to unpack that a little bit. And then he says he's the shepherd. But then there's these two promises. And one of the promises, I actually, in my opinion, would be enough, right? His first promise is like, uh, he, says, he says, salvation, right? Like you can come to the Father through me. Like Jesus says, I forgive you. Like ultimate forgiveness. Like forgiveness is enough. Like the Bible talks about how we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? And so someone uh, sacrificing their life for me and, and forgiving me, that sounds like enough. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He actually says there's salvation, there's forgiveness, there's freedom, there's full acceptance. But then he says, but there's this incredible life, a far better life than you've ever imagined. The different translations talk about green pastures or like... I have come that you might have life and life abundantly, or in the different, in the Phillips, far more life than before, um, or in the message, the one that I like the best, much and better life than you've ever dreamed of, right? So this door that Jesus offers up is not just forgiveness, right? It's, it's actually access to the greatest life we could ever imagine. And so, amazing verse. Today, I'm actually going to talk about three points, and I'm going to talk about three doors, right? And the first door I want to talk about is that one I've been saying is that Jesus is this door, right? That if it, some of you have relationships with Christ, and you've asked Jesus into your heart, and you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Jesus is the door. He forgives me. I then live my life with him, right? But there's others that are here or listening online that maybe have never fully understood this door. And so my question for you is, have you already or would you be willing to walk through this door, right? Like Jesus is saying ultimate forgiveness. I offer it to you, not because you deserve it, but because I love you, right? That he wants to bring us in and then offer us this amazing life. And so the first point is really simple. Jesus is the door. Do you have a personal relationship with Christ? In Revelations 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, eat with him, and be with them. Amazing, right? And so it's this free gift of a relationship with Christ. So certainly many of you have done that. Maybe some of you haven't, and I'd be glad to talk to you after the service about what a personal relationship with Christ means, right? But... Most of you have probably already done that. And so my other two points really have to do with, with you, right? And so um, my second point is that you practically are the door. 
And what do I mean by that? I don't mean that you can give forgiveness and that you don't have the power to forgive and offer people greater life. No, you don't have that. That would be heresy, and I'm not saying that. And if I did say that, I definitely would never be asked to preach again. And so um, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that you have the opportunity to point people to the door. It's the greatest opportunity you have. A friend of mine once said that we're just a beggar showing other beggars where the food is, right? Like, if you in life figured out a way to win the lotto and you could just have the numbers every week, right? But you could only win once, right? You could only win the lottery once, but you knew how to win the lottery. Wouldn't you tell your friends and loved ones the secret code? Because you already won the lottery, but you can't win it again, right? And so we're the door. We're this great opportunity to tell people about this life that's far better than we could ever imagine, this forgiveness that is more pure and amazing, right? And so we get to be the door. Now, I told you that I met Christ in high school through Young Life, and I did, but it's an interesting story, right? Like, I grew up in the church, but I didn't really understand what that meant. Like, I, I was very proud of the fact that I was an Episcopalian, but I had no idea what that meant, right? And so I started going to Young Life in high school, and I would go, and I would hear talks, and it was great. But when I was 16 years old, I remember being, I, I grew up in North Palm Beach, and I remember being on Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard at an ATM machine with my best friend Steve. And Steve had just gone to a Young Life camp where he had really heard the gospel in its entirety. And um, we were standing there at the ATM machine on Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard, and Steve looked at me and said, Brad, have you ever asked Jesus into your heart? Do you have a personal relationship with Christ? Like, I'd never been asked that question before. Like, I'd never understood the question. And I looked at him, and I was completely offended. And I said, what are you talking about? I'm an Episcopalian. My mother's an Episcopalian. My grandfather was an Episcopalian. We're from England. It's what I was born with, right? And Steve, very nicely, said, well, I think there's more to it than that, right? <laughs> right? And so um, uh, I remember then going to my Young Life leader. And can you imagine, those of you who are in youth ministry or have ever tried to share your faith or prayed that God would allow someone to like talk to you about God, could you, I walked up to my Young Life leader and I said, Jim, Steve tells me I have to ask, confess my sins and ask Jesus into my heart. And if I do that, I can have a personal relationship with Christ. Is that true? Could you imagine someone saying that to you? You're like, uh, what do I do now? Yes, it is true, right? And so Jim uh, very nicely said to me, well, Brad, actually, yeah. And then he walked me through what it meant to have a personal relationship with Christ. And so Steve, he was the door, right? He pointed to the truth. He risked telling his best friend what he heard at Young Life Camp. And you have this opportunity in your life to point to the door. And it's scary and hard, and I want you to know I'm so grateful that Steve gave me the numbers for the lottery. Because meeting Jesus in my life has changed everything. Everything of who I am has been impacted by the power of the gospel. And, and, and wow, what if Steve didn't share it, right? But the truth is, is that coming to this Sometimes there's this, there, it doesn't work, right? Sometimes you, do, you have people in your life and you do everything you can. Like you do everything you can to tell them about Jesus and they don't want to. And they're not interested. And you share and it's kind of met with deaf ears, right? Has that ever happened to you? It certainly happened to me, right? And so what do you do? Like what's, your, what's our hope? Well, you know, when I did meet Christ in high school, um, I, I have this great family, right? And, and one of my family members is my stepfather, Marv. And um, he was Jewish, right? And so, like, I started, I'm, I'm 15 years old. Actually, I met him when I was in eighth grade, so I was even younger. But I met Jesus a little later, and then I started praying for, for Marv. I started praying that he would m meet Jesus, right? And over the years, I'd have these conversations that didn't go well. Or he was open, but like, like he didn't, it, I didn't have it. Like it, did, I, it didn't matter if I, what I said, right? 
And, and, my, and, and I remember then getting married and then Wendy would talk about things. And he was spiritual, right? Like he wasn't anti-God. He just didn't know about Jesus, right? And so prayed and prayed and prayed for Marv. And it's almost like if you look back in my prayer journals as I have my quiet times, it's me praying for him, right? And for 30 years, right? You start kind of questioning what God's going to do. So a few years ago, we went on this trip. Uh, our family, we, <laughs> all the miles I get traveling around the country helping people, we just turn into these really fun trips. And so we were on one of these fun trips as a family, and we invited my mom and Marv to come with us uh, to uh, go on a cruise in Venice, leaving from Venice, right? Trip of a lifetime. So fun. But Marv, like, like he started like not feeling well, like right before the trip and then got on the trip and just started to declining really quick. And so um, he, they, they kind of get there and he's hobbling along, but then by the time we get on the cruise, he needs a wheelchair and he can't walk hardly, right? And um, the, doctor, the doctor on the ship gave him some injections and he, he made it through and it, it was a pretty good trip. But, but I had this, as I'm on this trip, I have this like fear because I had, you know, I'm using miles to make it everywhere and I, I can't spend a ton of money. So the cruise was supposed to end and then we're supposed to make our way to the airport where we rent a car and we drive to Genoa, Italy, and then we fly to Paris and then we rent a car and then we get into a hotel. Like it was a hard day back when everybody was mobile, right? But all of a sudden, have you ever seen Venice? Do you, do you remember what's in Venice? Those like little rivers with like bridges everywhere. Nothing's handicap accessible, right? And by the way, we had to leave the wheelchair that the cruise line loaned us on the cruise ship. So we were about to get kicked off the ship where we had to walk like a mile with the person who can't walk, right? And then we had to make it through all these stages. And I just remember thinking, as I woke up and had my time with Jesus that this morning, like, Lord, I can't do this. Like, this is the hardest day. Now, on that cruise ship, Wendy had had some really amazing conversations with Marv about God. It was a really great time. Like, not that he was ready, but Wendy it was even on that. I remember sitting on the deck and just watching Wendy and Marv asking really good questions, but it's not enough. But I had to make it through this really hard day, and um, I was truthfully scared that I was going to lose it and just yell right? That 30 years of prayer, and I was just going to say something horrible, and and because, you know, it was hard, right? I, we still have four kids, and they're younger then, and praise God for my son, Max. Um, he uh, just worked so hard that day and had the best attitude, and there's pictures out there in the world that of, like, Marv just hanging on Max, and Max just kind of carrying him through. It was a beautiful day, and I remember when uh, we got to the hotel, <laughs> my, I, tr I got upgraded, on the flight. Um, I was the only one that got upgraded out of the eight of us. And we just put Marv in that seat. It was so great, right? And so, but we got done with that day. We made it to the hotel. And I remember my mom and Marv getting into their hotel room and, and we had done it, right? And I just had so much praise. And Marv was so grateful, right? Like he knew it was hard and he was grateful. And so shortly afterwards, it made sense for Marv. And by the way, this is going to come back to the point. I'm going to get there. Um, but uh, uh, shortly after, uh, I, you know, I said to Marv and my mom, you know, you, you all should consider moving from Miami up here. And, and Marv had had such a great time on that trip that he was open to it, right? And I just, I reflected on the fact that if I hadn't, if I had lost it and said horrible things and been a jerk that day, I don't know if they would have moved here, right? But instead, um, they said yes, and, and my mom still lives here, um, obviously, and Marv has passed away. But the reason this connects to our talk is that now my mom and Marv live here, right? And, and the third door that I want to talk about is, is inviting people to the door of our church, right? And so when my mom and Marv moved here, like, they just, they just love us, right? So on Sunday morning, we invited them to come to church with us. And, and you know, Marv's always kind of liked gospel music, which is kind of an odd thing. But so he was cool coming to church, especially for the music. Um, but when they got to church um, shortly thereafter, um, some amazing small group leaders, some really good friends of ours who are here today, uh, um, uh, invited my mom and Marv to be in their small group. Now, remember, I had prayed for 30 years for Marv. I was starting to feel like this was one of those prayers you just pray that never get answered, right? 
But then they come to our church and they get invited to a small group. That's not my small group, right? And some other people from our church start investing in Marv and my mom, right? And, and what happens is, uh, is Fred led Marv to faith in Christ, right? A 30-year prayer was answered, right? And it's an amazing thing. And it's inviting people to the door of our church. Like the church, we are a rescue station. And sometimes you can't do it on your own. But God's planted you in a community, in a church. And this is where we bring people when we need help. Like, I think about all the people I've brought into our church. We've gone here for 30 years, and I've said, hey, I'm going to keep coming here until I die or you kick me out, right? That's my statement, right? And, and so, but I've brought people like my mom and Mark. I brought my grandmother. I brought my dad, right? This has been the place that I've brought people. It's a rescue station for your friends. When you're at your wit's end, you can invite your friends to our church, and then we, in community, can do things that alone we can't do. But the other thing I want to say about our church is that we're more than a rescue station for others. It's a rescue station for you, right? Like, I told you I worked for Young... Oh, I didn't tell you, but I used to work for Young Life, right? For, for 20 years, I worked for Young Life, and that's what I did before... I uh, had these businesses, right? And I remember when it was time for me to leave Young Life. It was a hard thing. Like, I love the ministry of Young Life, but it was time for me to leave. And when I left, I had to have an exit interview with the president, right? Because it's a big deal when somebody who has some sort of significant role leaves. And I was just afraid, right? And so I remember going to Dave. Afraid is the wrong word. I just was overwhelmed, right? And it was Sunday morning. And I had to get on a plane to fly to Colorado to meet with the president of Young Life to have my exit interview, right? And I just didn't know if I could do it, right? I was so overwhelmed. Because Young Life is what I know. I met Jesus, and then I went on Young Life staff, and there was a lot of security for me to just be the guy that worked for this ministry, right? I had a lot of my identity, good or bad, wrapped in, up into it. But to have to fly to Colorado, I just was overwhelmed. And so I walked up to Dave at about this time in the morning, and I said, Dave, I, would you come with me to my exit interview for Young Life? And he said, oh, well, maybe. When are you leaving? I said, in about 10 minutes. <laughs> you know? And Dave came with me, right? And, and I offered to pay for the ticket, and the church paid for Dave's ticket. And Dave came to my exit interview and sat next to me as I talked about what God was calling me to do next with the president. And, and it was so interesting because the head of HR was there, and he said, you know, we have rules that we don't allow um, spouses to come because it's going to be too emotional. We don't allow attorneys to come because then you can get sued. But no one's ever brought their pastor, you know. And, I, and then the vice president of HR looked at me and said, what kind of church do you go to that your pastor is willing to come with you? And I'm like, it's a really good church, you know. <laughs> And so, like, I think about that. Like, so our church is a rescue station for others, and please bring people through the door. But come through the door yourself because we need community. Like, life isn't always easy. Thank you for clapping. Um, the other time that I wanted to share about is when my son Jack was born. Um, obviously, Jack, we adopted Jack, and he's here. He's amazing. He's an awesome young man. Very proud of him. But, you know, we found out we were ado adopting Jack and met him the same day. You know, many of you might not know the story, but we had always dreamed of adopting a child. Like, it was something that we always felt like we want to have our own kids and we want to adopt a child. And so we thought it would just happen, and it didn't just happen. So we started the process of adopting a little girl from China and did all the paperwork for that. And then the Chinese adoption stuff really slowed down. And so we, um, we uh, were just staying in the line like we had had this line we were in to have a, a baby, a little girl from China. And so our home study had expired because they only last for three years. And um, one day uh, we had, it expired. So we called the home study worker and said, can you please come back out and renew our home study? And she said, sure. We scheduled an appointment. And then she showed up late that day and she got to our front door and said, I know you want to adopt a Chinese girl, but a little boy was born this morning in St. Augustine. Would you like to adopt him? Right? And so we were so excited to get to adopt Jack and got to meet him the day he was born. And um, it's really an amazing story because it's our church at work, right? Why is it our church at work? Well, because the head nurse that morning, right, when Jack was born, 
they didn't know where Jack was going. The mother was not going to be able to keep the baby. And the, the nurses that morning were so overwhelmed not knowing the future of this child that in a very unnormal way at Flagler Hospital, a member of our church, they gathered around Jack and prayed that God would somehow intervene and do something that Jack could have this future, right? So these, this, this member of our church prays that God would somehow intervene. Meanwhile, this, this home study worker comes to our house and asks us if we'll adopt, adopt this young little boy. And we said yes. And then before Beth, the, the, um, the nurse that day, before her shift was over, we were up knocking on the door saying, we're adopting that little boy. And she just burst out weeping, right? Because God had answered her prayer. But the reason that relates to the door is that Wendy and I weren't, Wendy was like six months pregnant at the time. We weren't expecting to have a baby that day, right? So what does Wendy do? Wendy calls up Beth, you know, a friend of ours at church and says, we're having a baby. To, well, actually, we had a baby today and we're bringing um, him home in two days. And, and our church gathered around us in such a way, giving us everything you could imagine, offering us every resource. It was a beautiful time in our lives, right? And so invite people through the door, but come through the door because we need each other, right? That's what church is. Church isn't Sunday morning worship for hopefully only an hour, right? That's not what church is. Church is living in biblical community with people over a long period of time. And let me tell you, this isn't a perfect church because we're not perfect people, right? But a bunch of imperfect people come together with a common purpose of growing closer to Jesus. Great things happen. And, and I know there's a temptation to, like, to, to, to find the newest and best and that there's a better church. Like, I know there's a temptation. But Wendy and I's our commitment has been to just go and stay and stay <laughs> and stay, Right? And that's, our, that's my vision, because great things happen. And so um, what I wanted to leave you with is sort of an action step of, that I hope is fun for you. Um, I just, my action step is simple. It's um, like enter into a relationship with Christ. If you haven't already, it's the greatest thing you can do with life. It is better than knowing the numbers for the lottery, right? It's better relationship with Christ. There's another I am statement in the Bible, and I didn't get to preach on I am the door. I, I got to preach on I am the door. Jesus is the door. But he also says in a different place in John that he is the bread of life, right? And I love preaching on that. I used to preach on that to high school kids. And some of my high school kids are here, but they're like 40. Um, but, um, but you still look the same. I just want you to know you look the same. Um, but um, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I used to love to give a talk and say, when Jesus says he's the bread of life, it's like Jesus saying, eating a meal, imagine eating a meal and never being hungry again, right? That's how satisfying a relationship with Christ is. It's permanent fullness from food, right? And I know me, I eat, and about two hours later, I'm like, I really want to eat again, right? But Jesus, a relationship with Christ, I am the bread of life, it's, it's everything you need. It's not that it's not hard at times. He gives us this church, this door to walk through. It is hard at times, but he gives us community to do it. And so um, my action step is enter in and uh, bring others with you. Like bring, bring the world around you uh, into this place. You know the secret of life. And now, if you didn't before today, I've told it to you. And uh, bring others with you. So... Um, I think I'll get asked back because I ended in 30 minutes. And so, um, <laughs> so let me pray for us and, and then uh, we'll have a song. So Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to be in a relationship with you, Lord. It would have been enough if you just forgave us. Forgiveness sounds awesome. Uh, but Lord, you not only gave us forgiveness, but you gave us this far better life than we could ever dream or imagine. And so Lord, thank you. And Lord, I do pray that you would allow us to invite others around us and show people what you're doing in the world, show people what it means to have a relationship with you. And Lord, I do pray for our church that we could be a rescue station for others. And Lord, thank you that this is a rescue station for us. And so Lord, we love you. In your son's name I pray. Amen.